Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, I'm here in the delightful city of Prague. No, not on a stag weekend. I've been here because there's a general election coming in Prague in a few weeks' time, and I've been supporting a party that is like a younger brother to UKIP, I guess. Inspired by Brexit, they think the Czech Republic perhaps might do better not being governed from Brussels. And whether you want to or not, there's no escape from Brexit, because the news today is dominated, of course, by Theresa May's speech which he's giving tomorrow in Florence. Odd choice, you might think, although some say it's been a great trading port for centuries, it was part of the European Renaissance. I still, for the life of me, can't quite work out why it's being done in Florence, but Florence it is. The Prime Minister has no other engagements there at all. Interestingly, the EU's chief negotiator has himself been in Italy today. I don't honestly know why. So what is at stake here? Well, let's be clear, there has been a massive rift in the UK cabinet. People like the Phil Hammonds of this world who want us ultimately to become like Norway, want us to stay part of the single market and go on paying fees to be in the club and he believes that's the safest and best thing for business. And then you've got the Borisites and the Goves on the other side who want us to finish up with a trade deal rather more like that that we have from Canada. Boris, of course, as you know, intervened last Saturday with a 4,000-word piece in the Daily Telegraph, setting out, I suppose what I would say, a Brexit means Brexit position. I'm told from those inside the Conservative Party that that has had an effect. I'm told that Mrs May tomorrow will not go for a European economic area, Norwegian-type long-term option. But the real question, the real question is this. Boris's article did not talk about a transition period. And indeed, personally, I'd thought the transition period was the two-year period of Article 50. They were the two years to sort everything out. Will Mrs May go for a transitional deal tomorrow? Will she go for another two or three years of us paying in and then perhaps a Brexit bill on top of it. So if you think about it, we could finish up, in a sense, paying double. That's one of the big questions. Uh, other questions, of course, uh, you know, it remains to be seen exactly what Theresa May is going to say tomorrow. Will she mention a figure of 20 billion? Won't she? For certain, I think, my money says that she will go for a transition deal. It'll last for two to three years. Uh, I wonder whether that is what Brexit voters voted for. But please, whichever side of the fence you're on, tell me what you think. If, like me, you think a transitional deal is unacceptable because it means paying twice and it stops us signing trade deals with other big economies and emerging economies around the world, then call me on 0345 6060 Maybe you think, Nigel, you're talking rubbish. We need to be conciliatory. We need to do everything we can to be as close to the single market, even if we're not part of it, in which case text to 84850. Or perhaps you're a hardliner who thinks the time has come to simply say, cheerio, we're off. In which case, you can text using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. You can watch us live from here in this delightful room here in Prague. And you can also comment on the Facebook page too. And we have a caller. We have John in Basingstoke, who's never called this show before. John, what do you want the Prime Minister to say tomorrow? I would absolutely adore the Prime Minister to stand up for the citizens and say, no, thank you, um, either deal with us in good faith or we're leaving because they're just bullying us at the moment. What would you, John, what would you define, I mean, I completely understand, I mean, I completely understand the tenor of your question. What would you define as good faith? Um, so, well, as Lord Hesseltine said yesterday on LBC, he made it perfectly clear that they're going to make, they have to make an example of us because for years we've been the second biggest payer in so now we want to leave. Other countries are rumbling at leaving. If they don't crucify and make an example of us, then other people will leave and the EU will collapse. Now, obviously, they don't want that because that's their jobs. So they're going to do what they can yeah. to protect it. It's funny, isn't it? I, I, I've just spoken, John, to just over 500 people in a, in a, in a public meeting here in Prague. Mm. And the Czech Republic export to the United Kingdom, uh, you know, at a surplus. Uh, the UK is their fourth most important market in the world. And talking today to Czech businesses um, and Czech people, they want 
a grown-up free trade deal with the United Kingdom. And I begin to ask myself, yeah. who does Barnier and Juncker represent? And John, I think you're on the money. I think they've stopped representing the countries that are part of the EU. They've stopped representing the citizens. They've stopped representing those, those, those companies. They are representing a fantastic way of life with a 16% top tax rate, great lunches, I'm not against that necessarily, but great lunches, and, and, and the best pension scheme in the world. And John, you're right, that's what it's all about. But what does May do, John? Does she say, unless you do this, we walk away? Does she give them one more chance? No, it's, 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 this is just a negotiation. As anyone that's ever had a real job, they've had to negotiate at some point. You, you yeah. go and you strong, and if people won't bend, you have to be prepared to walk away. She said Brexit means Brexit. I voted Remain, but now we've got people trying to backdoor democracy to make us remain, even though we as a country voted Leave. So they're trying yep. to backdoor the democracy. She said she was going to take us out. Take us out. And if they won't negotiate in good faith, as in treat us sensibly and, and say, OK, how do we come to a compromise that's mutually beneficial rather than starting to dictate terms to us, uh, you know, we never signed up to be dictated to from Brussels in the first place. That's why we, we have such well, a affiliation in the first place. Well, actually, John, I think uh, that my parents' generation did sign up for us to be dictated to in Brussels. It's just that nobody ever told them the truth in the first place. John, I thank you for your call. I thank you for your call. I think your position. These people, they're bad people. They're not behaving well. Mark in Liverpool, good evening. Hi, Nigel. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah. So, Mark, L L what, what do you want to hear? Liverpool calling. Uh, uh, just a pleasure to talk to you, Nigel, first of all. Um, so, w we're giving £10 billion a year. How much of that is coming back to us, that, that £10 million? Because at the moment... No, 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 no. The net, the net, our net payment to the European Union varies between eight and ten billion pounds a year. That's net. That's after the bits of money have come back um, to rich landowners, uh, to scientific projects, to regional aid. The net figure is eight to ten billion pounds every single year. Well, I've, I've been watching Theresa May in New York. She, she looks like a dead woman walking to me. She looks absolutely finished. Like, uh, she look, and and, and um, that price looks like the man to, who's going to take over, in my opinion. I think, I think she's absolutely done. Unless, unless that speech is uh, Churchillian tomorrow, which I very much doubt it is, I think she, she's absolutely done. And Boris or uh, uh, Moggy's going to come in as well. Moggy. I, we keep hearing yeah. about this Mog figure. Well, do you know what, Mark? I, I, I actually think, I've said it now for weeks and weeks and weeks, unless she re-establishes absolute control over her party and over the Brexit process, then I think she'd be gone by Christmas. I agree with you, Please. Mark. I think it's a massively important moment for her tomorrow. Mark from Liverpool, another first-time caller. Thank you. On texts and tweets, JM says, I wanted to say, we've tried negotiating with you. It's obviously not working or going to work. So we're off. Surely, JM, we give them one last chance to be reasonable, don't we? David says, I'm hoping Theresa May's speech is a take-it-or-leave-it offer. We shouldn't pay a penny more than our obligations. That's what David says, and I have to say I rather agree. And Joe says, the Florence fix-up. May and Barnier in Florence, plotting behind the British people's backs. May should be chucked out. Boris got it right. Give the EU nothing. Well, Joe, what's interesting is that her speech was given to the cabinet this morning and they all walked out as chums in fact Hammond and Boris being seen close together so so could it be that Boris's fine brave words in the Daily Telegraph last Saturday that he himself has actually compromised and backtracked on that I don't know but maybe Tom from Brentwood has got the answer Tom good evening good evening how are you well, Tom, I'm well. So what motivated you to call this show, which you've never done before? Because I just politically we disagree on a lot of things. And I just want to get your opinion on a couple of things. Without sure. talking about politics, because we disagree on a lot. But okay. when you said about the UK leaving the European Union, which we are unfortunately going to do, I voted to remain, and yeah. about the Norway module, should we be more involved? I personally think we should. Should we cut all ties and try our own? I strongly against that. But it's just, I don't want to say too much because, for instance, the VAT union, well, no one really talks about the VAT union. 
we are going to come out of the VAT union, even if we have the Norway module, we'll be out of the VAT union completely. And I just want your thoughts on the VAT union, if that makes sense, because you're... Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, Tom, what most people, I bet 95% of people listening to yeah. this show right now, Tom, will not realise one thing. Value-added tax, VAT, only yeah. came in because we joined the European Economic Community. That's why that came in. Prior to that, we had something called sales tax. Now, I'm pretty skeptical. What? Well, yeah, but I'm unsure, but that's the historical context of this, okay? Now, leaving the European Union gives us the option to examine whether we think VAT is the right model for indirect taxation or whether it might be better to go back to a former sales tax perhaps, if it was possible, to be charged more at the point of wholesale than retail, if that could be done. And, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that's simple. Tom, my view of VAT is it's a complex system. It involves millions of self-employed people effectively being unpaid tax collectors for the government. And it's shown itself through all sorts of complicated carousel schemes to be wide open to fraud. So I would say, Tom, on leaving the European Union, we should completely, and not, you know, this is not an urgent thing, it's not on the front burner, but I would say, Tom, we should re-examine VAT and see if sales tax might not be better. What do you think? I'm, I, I want to work in EU VAT. I'm, regardless of what country, I'm looking to work abroad next year. So I'm for we should be more involved with the EU VAT system purely and simply for trade. With the single market, I believe we should be in the single market. Me personally, I haven't got a problem with immigration from the EU. I look from a student point of view. When you've got students coming over, their class is immigration. They might only be here for a year and they're just students. I don't believe that should be counted as immigration because they're students. If they're working and living here, then yes, I do. I agree, but some things you say about, for instance, people living here, what you said on ITV, they might be earning 18 to 21, 22, 3,000, and they're not contributing enough at the start. I disagree with that because I know people who I work with but are... Well, 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 Tom, 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 look, you know, this is not my opinion, you know, for somebody to be an economic benefit to the United Kingdom who comes here, they need to earn over about £28,000 a year. But, of course, against the economics, there could be skill shortages, there could be jobs that other people don't want to do. There are lots of ways we calibrate this. But just, Tom, the one thing for certain where you and I are going to disagree is you say we should stay part of the single market. But we can't do that because we voted to leave it, Tom. No, I agree we voted to leave it, unfortunately, but I believe that... People should have the right to change their mind. If the Brexit negotiations don't go as well as people think they will go, I believe they should have the opinion to change their mind. Also, say we voted to remain and four or five years down the or three, four years down the line, things weren't as promised as they were. We should have another referendum. No, we shouldn't have another referendum. Well, but I, well that, I tell you what, Tom. I tell, you, I tell you what, Tom. And Vince Cable's finding this in the opinion polls where the Lib Dems last I saw were on 5%. The, attitude, the appetite for a second referendum is pretty near zip. Tom from Brentwood, I thank you. Prime Minister May is off to Florence to give the big Brexit speech, and I'm asking you, what do you want her to say? Is it acceptable to go for a transition period? Should she be offering 20 billion on top of that in, in the form of an exit fee? What are we going to hear? And I mentioned earlier that Monsieur Barnier was also in Italy today, and I wondered why. Well, he has made a few comments today. He said that six months have gone by since the government triggered Article 50, and there is therefore only one year left to swiftly reach an agreement on the United Kingdom's orderly withdrawal. Why does he say one year left? Because once there is a deal, it then has to be ratified by all the parliaments in all the other 27 member states. So Barnier piling on the pressure. And I have to say this, on the one hand, he keeps telling us, get on with it. Time's running out. And on the other, he keeps making an impossible series of demands. One thing for certain, we know who's got the whip hand in these negotiations, and at the moment, it's not the British government. Perhaps that above all else is what we'd like to see Theresa May wrestle back. 
tomorrow. Now, Laura from Shenfield in Essex says, Hi, Nigel. Florence, I have more faith in Florence of the Magic Roundabout. Love it. Jay says, I think she should say, if you reformed, we would have stayed. This is your doing. Well, uh, maybe reform, Jay, or maybe actually given Cameron some sort of concession on open borders and immigration, but they weren't prepared to do it. And, of course, they never thought we'd vote for Brexit anyway. They really didn't. David says, I wanted to set a transitional period of a maximum of two years, which does not include tariffs or any costs. Well, David, we may have a transition period of two years with no tariffs. We will be paying for it, because I think that pass has been sold already, and that's my prediction. I'll say it again. I think tomorrow the Prime Minister is going to say we will have a transition period that will last up to the next general election and we'll pay our 8 to 10 billion a year happily. Well, I won't be happy because we didn't vote for that and surely two years and nine months, which is where we will be since the Brexit vote at the end of March 2019, uh, surely two years and nine months is plenty of time to sort this out. Do you know, if this was the private sector sorting this out. The whole thing will be done and dusted in 90 days, and that I do seriously believe. James in Rochester is my next caller. James, good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Nigel. Uh, my expectations regarding Theresa's statement tomorrow being somewhat influenced by her speech at the UN, which I only heard for the first time today, and which yep. I found uh, pretty disappointing. For me, it was actually a turning point um, in the things that she said. Um, for in, just on a wider scale, her stab at Trump in her comments about protectionism were disappointing uh, and gave the impression that she lacks understanding. Uh, her praise of the, uh, the Paris Climate Accord uh, was also something that I queried when it's known among sincere non-political scientists that the issue of climate change and the factors potentially influencing it are anything but clear. The worst, however, for me was when she said that the only way to respond to the current global challenges was to come together and defend the international order which they have yeah. worked so hard to create, yeah. quite. An international order which inflicts year-upon-year -year losses in real earnings through incessant inflation, which has seen destruction of SMEs through the support of corporate interests, pursuing relentless agenda of acquisitions and mergers as well as offshoring, which has created increasingly controlled, bureaucratic and unpleasant working environments and even societies, and which has seen much of the world enslaved to national debt. Fantastic. I mean, James, James, this is James, what she, what she showed, James, James, what she showed yesterday, and you're quite right, to point some of these things out. What she showed yesterday is that she believes in the international order. She believes in the big supranational structures. I put it to you, James, what she really showed us yesterday with that speech at the UN is that she was a Remainer to her very core. Sadly, while listening to that speech today, it became clear to me that May is just another globalist Marianite, and while I don't suspect for a moment that this comes as any surprise to you, it was a disappointing realization for me, and that's kind of framing my expectation for tomorrow. Regarding offering a, some sort of uh, fee or divorce bill, I think this is just astonishing. I mean, what for? At the minute that she puts a number on the table, we're going to be at a disadvantage, because then it's going to be a question of negotiating this. Um, but there's a couple of other questions. I don't know if it's allowed, but that I'd like to... No, James, you've had a good run. You've had a good run. There are lots of people who want to call. I th and I know, James, you've never called before. I welcome you again, but I have to give people, everybody, as many as I can, a fair crack of the whip, which is why I'm heading to West London, to Hounslow, to speak to David. Good evening, David. Good evening, David. Oh, good evening. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> Just, just, just say it's a really sad day today, um, and I don't know if you if you know what's happened, but um, the great uh, I do. Ted Taylor died. Yes, I uh, do. Uh, Sir Teddy yeah, Taylor, who was who, yeah. who who represented a form of conservatism that doesn't exist anymore. He was a working class guy from Glasgow who got into politics. Uh, he was a member of Parliament for. Glasgow Cathcart, if memory serves yep. me rightly, he lost his seat. He then went down to South End, where mm -hmm. he was an MP for many, many years. He was hugely popular down in South End, very down to earth kind of guy, um, was religious, didn't drink, smoked a lot, and loved Bob Marley, and used to play you're, Bob Marley you're, in his you're, car. You're, you're, missing the, you're missing the elephant here. <laughs> and, 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 and David. And, David, he was one of the first Conservative MPs that was a committed Eurosceptic. 
Indeed. I remember him coming to a conference and, has him, and he spent his 40, 40 years in political life telling everyone what a rubbish Europe is and it's a fraud and it's a scam. And I remember him coming <laughs> to a conference showing us um, the Lawnmower Harmonisation Act, which meant that the Department of Trade and Industry had to come and inspect your lawnmower to make sure it admitted the right noise. And if it didn't, you went to jail. And it was, of course, a European protectionist racket to stop an importation uh, yeah. coming in from yeah. Asia. Yeah. Um, no, but, I will. Um, I, David, I'll join you. I'll pay tribute to Sir Teddy, and I did do that on Twitter earlier today. And in 2004, despite having been a Conservative for over half a century, he shared a platform with me in Southampton when I was running for the European Parliament, and I was very touched uh, that he did that. David, beyond Sir Teddy, and you're quite right uh, to have raised his name, what do you want to hear from May tomorrow? What I want to hear from May tomorrow uh, is that she's not going to surrender. It's that simple. It's no surrender. Uh, we are going to play hardball with them and that we are going to uh, beat them at their own game. We've got the advantage because we've got the finances, that we've got uh, everything running in our favour and we can move down side faster than the countries. But just one quick question. What yep, yep. did Teddy Taylor... I, I reckon Teddy Taylor did more for the Brexit movement than you on the basis that he spent 40 years going out to the constituencies telling everyone what a load of rubbish Europe is. And those activists who were involved all the way through the referendum campaign, a lot of them would have been touched or affected by the influences of what Teddy had taught them over those years. And if it hadn't been for him, you wouldn't have got as many people in the, those age groups who are sympathetic to that perspective um, that Europe is a scam. And David, I Teddy, was a, Teddy was a great old-fashioned politician who believed in things, who wasn't in... Uh, in it for uh, climbing up the greasy pole. That didn't really interest him. I agree, I agree with you. He was a great parliamentarian. David, I thank you. And I've quickly got time before the news for Pavel from Twickenham. Pavel, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you for the, for the second time. And thank you for defending the Polish and the Hungarian government in the European Parliament. And, this, um, is, this is going to be a... Yeah, I mean, we'll discuss this another week, um, Pavel, you know, that basically they're being bullied uh, to take some of Mrs. Merkel's migrants. But, but for now, what would you like to hear? You've got 45 seconds to tell me. What should Mrs. May say tomorrow in Florence? She, she should make uh, it uh, more coherent because at the moment it's very chaotic. And she should stop playing European EU migrants, uh, like Poles, uh, you know, using them as a playing card. It needs to be addressed, it needs to be said, uh, what conditions will be there. There's lots of people leaving already because of the uncertainty. If that's the aim of Brexit, to get rid of lots of Poles, that's not a problem. They will go, we will go. There's already lots of my friends going. But Britain will lose net contributors. You were saying that you need to earn about 28,000 to be a net contributor. I've yeah. been here for 10 years. I was earning from 22,000 up to 28,000 uh, about a year ago, and I was always a net contributor. I w I've paid at least 3,500 uh, pounds in taxes every year, and I've been to a GP three times, and that's all. That's okay, Pavel, 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 you want some certainty on your status from Theresa May, and I want her to take control of these negotiations back from Barnier and show them who is boss thank you for your call mrs may goes to florence to give a speech that will define brexit and will decide whether she saves her career or not that's certainly my view and it is the view of many others and i want to hear your view any view within reason that you've got and you can give it to me by calling 0345 6060 973 and if you're a new caller i'll try and give you priority now meanwhile the german elections are taking place they will be on this sunday the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, the Eurosceptic Party, are making progress. Gosh, they must be. I'll tell you why. Because Peter Altmaier, who's the Chief of Staff to the German Chancellery and the Federal Minister for Special Affairs, has spoken out today in the German newspaper bill. He said, AFD splits our country. A vote for them is not justified. And when asked directly if it was better for voters to vote AFD than not to vote at all, Altmaier replied, no. And I quote, I advocate that all go to the election, but that they choose the parties that are state-sponsored. Do you remember what I said about Mr. Juncker last week? That his plan in the future 
is that the EU will fund passes that support the European Union and make sure that those that don't, don't get any money. And here you're hearing it from a German minister. That's what he thinks people should do. The new communism is coming. Thank God we're leaving. Now, back to our callers. I'm going to Trevor, who's in Dulwich. Trevor, what should the Prime Minister say? Hello, Nigel. I'm going to give you three things. I'll be as quick as possible. Okay. If I walk into a gamble sh gambling shop and spend all this money, win some money, when I finally realise it's not good for me, when I walk out that door, I do not pay no more money, do I? No. Nope. So you've done you've done your dough, and that's the end yes. of it. Yep. And we should not pay them a penny because we've decided to leave. So if they want us to 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 to, to come back crawling to them, they have to go by our terms, the balls in our court. And I'll tell you the okay. reason why of this. We've never mm -hmm. need Britain has never needed Europe to be at the top of the world. Britain was at the top of the world way before this European currency. One, they're a bit jealous because we kept our sovereignty mm. and they didn't. So they're trying they tried if we did if they if we did vote to stay, I guarantee you we will be just like all the other countries that left England, blah blah we would have a Eurozone representing our country at some point in the future. We've decided yep. to go, and I think in the future, the long term, Europe, when Europe do finally fall, because every nation does, when they do fall, they'll all be looking for the same deal that we are looking for now, and Great, Great Britain will be hundreds of years in front, and they will be coming back to Great Britain. Right, so... Our so, Trevor, no more money. We've spent enough. We've lost our money. Cut our losses and run, Trevor, yeah? We're not running. We will stay as Britain. We'll go back to the Britain that made us who we are today. We'll negotiate with all those countries who have had yep. to deal with places like China for, for negotiating trade deals, have to put China at the top of their trade list. We'll go back there and reinstate what loads of people want from Africa to South America. They well, want Trevor, back. Trevor, do you know what? Countries are queuing up all over the world to get closer to us, and the other thing that would upset me is a transition deal would mean we couldn't sign these deals for years. Trevor, I know you wanted to say three things, but I've let you say one at length. You've said it very well, and I thank you very much indeed for your call. Uh, Paolo on Twitter says, I feel tomorrow will either make or break Theresa as PM. She must tell the EU to take a hike, though I doubt she will. Tanis on Facebook says, I would like her to give us a vote on the final deal. I don't trust the government to look after our great country. Why trust May to backpedal on Brexit? Well, we'll see. Now, we're going to a caller now, and he's not just a new caller. He's a caller with a name that is on the verge of extinction, if you look at today's tabloids. He's burdened, he's burdened with the name Nigel, and he lives in Chelsea. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. I was actually one of the first, um, and then it became far too popular. But anyway, there you go. Um, <laughs> listen, I, I rang to say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Leave voter, I was a Leave voter, I, rem I still am a Leave voter. Yeah. Um, I'm very much against the transition period, I think it's complete waste of time in a shower. Um, she took three months out to kind of, you know, botch it, botch it with her election and so on. It's pointless. Yep, yep. I'm totally with your last caller. I don't think we should pay them a penny um, from May, whatever it is, March 2019. Um, yep. I don't think we should pay them a penny. However, um, here's the thing. She's, if she puts 20 billion on the table, whether, I don't think she'll do it in Florence, but perhaps quietly it's being said in the background and will be yeah. part of negotiations, they're not going to accept it. Barnier can't take 20 billion. He opened with 60, and then they went on to 100, thanks to the Chevalier Donneur, who runs the Financial Times. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They the Financial Times doing accept. their bit to work for everybody in the world apart from British interests. Now, I agree with that. Um, so, 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 she puts, so, Nigel, she puts 20 down and they just refuse, do they? They'll take it as an opening offer. Right. They'll take it as an opening offer. They'll go, OK, I think we could get 40 out of this, because that's the way they are. They just negotiate. <laughs> their, 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 
they're not win-win negotiators, right? They're win-lose negotiators because they don't know what they're doing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feature of psychopaths. They're a psychopathic institution. They can't see a win-win negotiation. That's a problem. Gosh, yeah. I'm, I'm so speaking to a Nigel. I'm speaking to a Nigel who's more Eurosceptic than I am. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, yeah. so, so, Nigel, so, 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 so what does May, in a sentence, what does May say tomorrow? I think she will offer them 20, and I think they'll say 40. I've never thought there's a deal. Neither, neither does my German brother-in-law, incidentally. Um, mm. He doesn't think there's a deal. We've never thought mm. it was possible. The moment somebody right. says 60 billion, it was out the wind. The British public will never support paying anything more than this 20. She's a fool, because it, this should have been the final position, not the opening offer. You know, right. if okay. 20, they'll go for more. Believe me, right. it's not going to happen. There isn't going to be a deal. I've said this from the beginning. I can't see how it could possibly happen. I, I don't think there'll be a deal. I have a feeling, um, Nigel, that you may well be right. And I thank you very much indeed for your call. There we are, a Nigel that maybe looked like a Europhile. John from Wales says, Hi Nigel, I'm furious with Theresa May for giving her keynote in Florence. This should have been given at the dispatch box in the House of Commons before MPs. I have a feeling, John, quite a few people might actually be agreeing with that and wondering why on earth Florence. Derek says, Isn't two years after Article 50 enough of a transition? She needs to outline that 2019, we're out. Margaret from Stoke-on-Trent says, if she keeps us in for another couple of years and then Corbyn gets into number 10, we will never leave. Whatever she says, it's going to have to be good tomorrow. Well, I think that's one thing, Margaret, that we're absolutely all agreed on. I wonder what Alan in Chiswick makes of all of this. Alan, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Uh, well, <laughs> I've got a different opinion, completely opposite to you. If I'm talking to and walking down that... To make that speech tomorrow, I won't go myself. I will send you and Boris Johnson and say, you know what? Sorry for all the mess we made after Brexit. You guys made a big mess out of the the Brexit campaign. You made you made a lot of false accusations. This and this and that happened. The 350 million euro pounds that you said you guys said they're going to put it back in. I never, uh, Alan, 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 Alan. I never said anything of the kind, did I? You didn't say, but Boris Johnson said that he was on the on okay. his bus, and this is what I would say. You know what, Theresa May, I will I will say sorry for the last eighteen months. We made a big mess out of Europe. Please accept us back. We pay even ten percent of the top of what we were what we were paying before, just because <laughs> of the mess we made it out of. Listen, let me make a point. I'm British, and I'm not from Europe, so I'm not worried uh, about my future. So, uh, Alan, I mean, are you happy, Alan? Yes. Are you happy, Alan, yep. for us to rejoin a European Union that Mr. Juncker set out last week will have a European Army, Air Force and Navy in place by 2025, will, where everybody will have to join the Euro and will be run by one powerful president? Are you happy to rejoin what that Euro? What is wrong with that? What fine? is wrong with no, that? No, no, that's is... fine, Alan, but I think you need to accept that if you put that proposition to the British people in a referendum, I doubt your side would get 10%. Why would you need the army in the first place? If you unify all Europe, then eventually you can unify the whole world. You don't need any need the army. Well, Mr. Ju well, well Mr. Juncker, Mr. Juncker is very clear. He wants a strong European army. He wants the European Union to be a leading global superpower. Now, it might be Walter Mitty. We might question what's in his lunchtime glass, but that is what he wants to do. So, Nigel, mark my word. Yeah, remember this conversation. Brexit will never happen. Yeah? Okay. Because if okay. everyone abandoned the Alan Alan in Chiswick, you're going on file, and the day Brexit happens, I'm going to get you on the show. Thank you. What does Mrs May need to say in Florence tomorrow to keep her position as Prime Minister, unite her party, and perhaps take control of these negotiations back from Barnier, Juncker, Verhofstadt, and everybody else? But before that, and we had a caller on a few moments ago from Chelsea. He was called Nigel. And you may have seen a little news story today. The end is Nige. Nigels are nearing extinction after no British babies were given the name last year. So the history of Nigels is that in medieval times, there were lots of Nigels about. In fact, 
Uh, one of them was second in line to the Scottish throne. So there was nearly a King Nigel. The name is believed to have a Celtic origin that means champ or champion. Post-war, the baby boomers, there were quite a few Nigels around. The peak year was 1964, which happens to be the year in which I was born, in which it was the 23rd most popular name. It is now, it has been in terminal decline before I was well known and before Brexit. It really isn't all my fault, but that doesn't stop the pro-EU open Britain saying that I've caused a backlash and that's why no one is being called Nigel. Anyway, not many Nigels about, although I notice now, walking around the streets of London, nobody calls me that anyway. It all seems to be Nigel these days, for reasons I haven't quite worked out. Back to the question, what does May do tomorrow? Can she stay as Prime Minister if she really fluffs this? I wonder what Jeff in Edmonton thinks. Good evening, Sir Nigel. Yes, I, I believe uh, <laughs> someone needs to get a tissue for Alan. Um, yeah. I, well, well, at least, Jeff, at least, Jeff, the point about Alan from Chiswick is he is a European Federalist and he sees that model as being a precursor to global government. And oh. you and I may think that's a load of old nonsense, but I tell you what, the great thing about LBC is it gives a platform for everybody, pro provided their plight, to put a sincerely held view. And that's what free speech, that's what debate, that's what democracy is really all about. Fair play. Yes, what I'd like to say about uh, uh, Mrs May is that um, I think now she's sh finally shown her true colours. She is a globalist. She's a, a full-on Remainer. I mean, she tried to say, look, you know, I can do this on behalf of Brexit because, you know, that's my job and all that. But it's clear from the UN speech that she doesn't agree with Trump. She wants to go fully globalised and, you know, um, and basic New World Order sort of stuff. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, right, so, I, so, 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 Jeff, do you think... In that case, given you're the second caller tonight, deeply disappointed by her speech at the United Nations, do you think that tomorrow uh, she's frankly going to give too much away? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we should clear the way for Mog now because um, she's <laughs> not up for the job. Okay, Jeff. Couldn't be clearer. Thank you. Danny on Facebook says, hopefully, she will resign. And then we can get Roy Hodgson as Prime Minister. He has a fantastic record of leaving Europe swiftly. Footballing fans will get that joke. Philip says, uh, by text, we should not walk away. We should run. I wonder what John in Marlow makes of this. John, good evening. Hello, hello, Nigel. Yeah, thanks for the uh, history lesson, by the way, on the, on, on the name Nigel. That was... Uh, well, it's just very interesting that, you know, it, it, it literally has had these sort of two peaks, and in yeah. between times it just seems to disappear from view. There you go. It's a funny old thing. Perhaps it'll come back. I know. Those. But, well, well I, I, I did give a quote. Uh, yeah. to the Sun newspaper, and I said if Brexit was seen to be a huge success in five years, it might creep back. But for any child to be <laughs> named Nigel now would be an unfair burden, John, in my view. Or, or Boris. Anyway, what do you want the Prime Minister John to do tomorrow? Ba basically, uh, could you just remind us about these, this budgetary period? Because I think she mentioned, she kind of leaked part of her speech, didn't she, the Cabinet thing today, which they all seem to be quite jolly about. Okay. Um, wh okay. The, the, what, what the European Union does is it, it, it agrees a cycle of seven-year spending periods. And this current spending period ends in 2020. And I, I've always argued, uh, John, all the way through this consistently, that we were part of that decision-making process back in 2013. We as a government voted for it. Yeah. I as an MEP didn't vote for it, but that's not the point. Um, and so, if we're going to be honourable, and play the game properly, my argument, John, has been that we do owe them one more year, okay? Fine. But against that, we have investments in the European Investment Bank, etc., probably slightly in excess of what we'd have to pay for that year. So my view, John, has always been, let's call it quits. It's fine. There's no money owed anywhere. But would they, would they ever admit that they owe us money? I, mean, I don't th Edward think they're in the mood... I don't think they're in the mood to do that, John. I agree. Um, and maybe that's why 
I mean, maybe that's why Barney's initial uh, sort of 60 billion or whatever you want to believe. Uh, I mean, maybe that's why it was so unreasonable. Perhaps they're the ones that are unhinged, not us. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'll agree with you. I'll agree with you there for sure. Um, but the thing is, it, it does seem reasonable that she offers, you know, two years sort of transition, which means that that we both sides get access to their own single to their single markets. I mean, we are a single market in the UK, four countries. You know, big yep. uh, big markets for the uh, EU manufacturers, of course, uh -huh, and uh -huh. we we like some of theirs as well. So that would be fine as long as we can negotiate trade deals during that time um that's crucial that is john that is crucial but can we actually right. sign them yeah well otherwise you see there'll be another sort of two-year transition period after that whilst we try and fiddle around and do some sort of deal otherwise if we don't um negotiate trade deals in that transition period then there will be a cliff edge will yeah, there not i i yeah, no, there could well be. And no, you're absolutely right. And, what, and one of the ways of preventing what some call a cliff edge is to make sure you've got lots of other stuff in place as well. John, I thank you for your call. We will see. I myself don't trust transition at all. I don't think you do either. Maddie is calling me from Islington. Maddie, good evening. Hiya, Nigel. Hiya. So what should the PM do tomorrow, Maddie, in your view? Um, bon voyage. Just stop all the fapping and, um, you know, <laughs> mucking around. And I'm, I'm glad I've made you giggle. Um, yeah, you yeah. certainly have. Oh, voyage. <laughs> just stop right. all this nonsense, paper pushing, your micromanaging, you know, bureaucracy. It's just madness. Yeah, so you, I mean, are you getting a bit hacked off with all this, Maddie? Well, I mean, I know it's going to, you know, there's protocols in place and there's things that have got to be done. You know, I don't yeah. really understand, you know, too much about the, you know, intricacies of it all. And but it's just, I mean, I don't know why it has to be so difficult. Well, and, um, well, I don't think it does, Maddie. I think it's people that make things difficult. Yeah, sure, there's loads of technical stuff, but I just don't think their heart's been really in it, doing this properly, doing this cleanly, doing this crisply from day one. Maddie, I thank you for your call and for making me laugh. And my last caller tonight is John in Norwood. John, time is tight. You've got 30 seconds to tell us. You are the, you are the Prime Minister tomorrow. What are you going to say? She's got to ask a simple question. To openly to them, uh, and that is, what level of tariffs do you want us to put on your goods? <laughs> You've got a massive trade uh, uh, surplus with us. Yes. Do will make a massive windfall um, if we go to world trade rules. We'd make 13 billion, they'd make five. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a lose lose economic situation for them, and I think it's got to be made public. What level of tariffs do they want us? Because if they want to tariff us, and we just say okay, we'll go along with that and put that tariff on for you. That's what we John. Got. John, you're a star. And John's right. We hold some very, very strong cards in this negotiation. We just appear to be rather reluctant to use them. The point about trade. They want our markets. European companies, European workers want access to our markets. We've allowed the other side to dictate too much. If the Prime Minister tomorrow goes for a transition deal, during which we go on paying 8 to 10 billion a year net for the next three years, and then on top of that are expected to pay an exit bill whilst not being able to sign up and start international trade deals, then Brexit will have been made a flop by the Prime Minister, and that's not what I want to see. You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show.